there we go. I have my window open because I'm sitting in this little room and it's hot in here. So it's kind of noisy outside. If it bothers you, just let me know and I will um, close the window, but I'm gonna try to keep it open as long as possible. So I don't, <laughs> it's just, it's really stuffy today. So we'll wait a few minutes and then get started. Hello. Hello. Hi, Caroline. Okay, um, before we start, we'll wait about five minutes into class, but is anybody here struggling with the assignment from last week or feels like you need more time for it? Because that's a fairly complex one with Photoshop techniques using the masks. Okay. Did anybody enjoy it? That um, I can see from the work that's online. You need more time? Okay. I was thinking that. I mean, I was thinking about how I would feel doing this. What do you think, Marissa? How is it going? Well, my PC, like, it, I have to get a part for it because um, something's wrong with it. But mm -hmm. I'm currently, like, trying to do it on my Chromebook. It's just really difficult because, like, I have different, yeah. like, um, Keybind sending settings on my PC, so it's like kind of confusing. <laughs> Does the Chromebook process things quickly when you're using Photoshop, or do you have to wait while it kind of catches up with you? Or it kind of like takes a little bit, but I mean, like I get it because it is a Chromebook. But I mean, like I'm trying right. to like catch up on everything. It's just really hard. Yeah, I've never used one. I was just wondering what people are going through because there's so many people using them and it does t seem to take longer to do assignments. So yeah, I mean, I get the feeling. I mean, just from looking what's been posted in the messages that people can probably um, use another week with that assignment. And I, I did post one for this week. We can review it, but we can just take two weeks, you know, for you to finish up the new one and the other one to catch up with whoever needs to catch up. And then um, okay, good. Clayton says he is getting caught up. That's great. Uh, because it is, it's a lot of work and it's kind of hard to judge between a live semester and an online semester how quickly we can do things. Um, but I think people having different systems and it's been taking some time to get up to speed with the Chromebooks, obviously, that, um, you know, we'll slow things down a little bit. And I think this is the last assignment where it's just going to be Photoshop. We need to move into Illustrator. So I was wondering about that too. Were you all able to download the entire Adobe Suites or did you just download Photoshop? Um, personally, I have, I think like a couple of them, but like it's really expensive, I know. And it's kind of like hard for, I know, a lot of people right now to like pay for it. So like, I'm not really sure what to do about that if I can't pay for it. Yeah, I mean, Adobe Suites, um, they had a deal for students where you could, un I think, download a few of the programs. I wasn't sure, you know, which they were offering for students to download. So we can get by with Photoshop doing vector graphics in Photoshop. We can actually do our animation and our video project in Photoshop if we need to. Of course, for people with Macs, when we get to video, there's iMovie, which is, you know, free or I think $25 for the current 
version, which is nothing. So that's another option. But yeah, I mean, it's also computers, Chromebooks. I don't know if they can handle like Premiere for editing or Illustrator and Photoshop. Open is at the same time, which is what we do. So do you have Illustrator on your Chrome? Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no go ahead. <laughs> Um, do you know if like the ones in Moakley are like the computers, are they open for us to use at all or no? Yeah, they were open regular hours like three times a week. I think they've scaled that back just since some schools had an outbreak. Um, but I know they are open certain times during the week. So you can call over to Moakley to um, oh, Eric, what's his name, LePage, and he should be able to tell you he's in the um, the um, tech services. Okay, so I think he's managing those rooms over there. I'm not even sure where they, they moved them to a new bigger space. So there's more room to space. So yeah, they are open. So that's another option that we have. Yeah. I don't know how many people will be on towards the end of the semester. So right, thank you, Zoe. we'll keep the, all the options open if you can't do have premiere and want to use it i guess you could if you need to edit with photoshop it's just fine for doing video editing you can't do a lot of layering like you can with premiere but um it's fine or imovie so for that i think we're okay um if you don't have illustrator i think for the next assignment you'll be okay we'll just use again vectors in photoshop which you can do and we're the very last assignment is going to be doing vector graphics I guess we'll combine Illustrator and Photoshop for a product that we're going to try to get printed. I have to do some research into that, but you guys have lab fees that we're not spending on books. You did have to buy the software, but we can't apply lab fees for that. But this is a way to put the lab fees towards something concrete since we don't have the printer that we have in the labs where you're making prints to take with you. So I'm going to try to work that out with Kathy, but we'll need to do that you know, fairly soon after this next assignment. It'll be the next assignment because we have to have time for things to get returned to us. So logistically, I'll try to work that out, but um, I think that'll be a good applied assignment where you have to think about how to size things for a particular application and so forth. So I really want to do it. So anyway, um, yeah, I guess this week, I'll give you another week for the dual portrait mask assignment and then also the current assignment, which we'll go through today. And that this one's much, uh, much more abbreviated assignment. You shouldn't have to spend as much time with it. So you should be able to get caught up. Is anybody else concerned about timing or not being able to get caught up? Um, right now, on my computer, I'm using a different, I'm using one of my family's laptop right now and my computer is not working. So I'm okay. like trying to get up and technically I had my, uh, the homework already done, but like I, I was hoping to work on it. Yeah. You know um, and so I'm trying to like download it on my sister's, uh, on my sister's laptop and but it's not like, it's not downloading, it's always bringing back to my own Gmail. So I, I don't know why, but yeah, so mm -hmm. I don't know now. So like, I'm just waiting, if my laptop doesn't work, if my computer doesn't work right now, um, I just, I'm just gonna be like, I'm gonna, I have to go buy a laptop. I don't know when, but like, yeah. I'm gonna have to buy a new laptop for now. What kind of um, computer were you working with? Was it um, a yeah. It, it's it's like it's it's um technically is a uh, a gaming PC so I just oh, okay like, just took a long time to build it but that's what right. I've been using for my whole for yeah my that's whole I mean you could check with the library too to see if they have a loaner computer I don't know what time they require I mean how long people are able to keep them because they were running low on them but that's an option maybe while you're waiting to get a new one because I think they have Macs and PCs. So you could try asking over there. Um, but yeah, if you have one that you can borrow for now, I think, you know, let's see how it goes over the next couple of weeks. But if you feel like that's something where you're going to have to be switching computers all the time, I would probably check with the library to see what they have. So at least you'll have something in the interim because that's very <laughs> frustrating, I can imagine. Yeah, oh, no, go ahead. I live pretty far at the same time, so like I have to go. I don't know if they could send it or something. 
I don't know. I mean, you could call over there and ask. They have had to make special arrangements. Um, you know, those are always there during the semester, even when it's a regular semester. They may have set up something where they can do that. So the best thing is just to call the front desk and ask about loaner computers and they'll transfer you to the person. There's a few people dealing with that now. Um, so that might be an option. What were you trying to download that didn't come through? Was I, I, I was um, technically, I was just going and download Photoshop again, just to oh, start okay. working. Like, cause like technically the, the, the homework that was, that was due today, like I passed mm -hmm. it, but it was just like a work in progress. And, okay. and I was just trying to like put some more, de put some more stuff in it. But yeah. I just didn't have the time to like, since my computer didn't work, so like I didn't just didn't have the time to do it. So I've been trying to use, uh, I've been using all my sister's computer and see if the, like it won't download right now. So I'm gonna try to figure it out, but right now it's- and That's okay. Yeah, don't worry. We'll take an extra week. I really think that we need it. I'm gonna feel it <laughs> um, because there wasn't as much stuff online today. And you know, if I was doing this, I probably would. It's a lot of work, um, especially if you're not as familiar with Photoshop, so. Um, another thing you might want to check again is to call over to Moakley because we do have those great computers with all the software on them over there. So if there's some way you could upload your work or just save it onto a thumb drive and bring it over there during open hours, that's another option. But I know you live far away, so you know maybe plan around one day in there or something if you really you know can't get your system going. But okay. Yeah, it's a tough situation. We'll just take our time. I mean, I did you see your work that you posted in the portfolios and I, you know, it's nice, like original photography. So yeah, I can see why you'd want to work with that more. So that's a good start. Um, anybody else kind of feeling that this assignment specifically you need more time with? The one with the two portraits and the masks? I mean, using masks. Because I think, actually, what we'll do next week, since we're taking two weeks for the text assignment, which is assignment six, we'll just review everything that you've done in Photoshop. And then we'll do that, kind of consolidate that information before we move on to combining that with Illustrator. And then you'll have that extra time. So, okay. I think, um, so Marissa, do you want to share? Does anybody have, Anthony, you, got, you have some work, right? Do you want me to share it? It's good just sometimes to look at another example. So let me pull his up because it's a really nice graphic for this assignment. Okay, so he's saying he combined a darker mood at the top of the picture um, with a more, a lighter picture towards the center with a vacation type of picture in the window. Oh, let me go back to share screen. That would help, wouldn't it? <laughs> Hang on. I have to just set up the security. Okay, good, share screen. And I hope this is the right one. So hang on just a second. Oh, there we go, okay. So yeah, um, I'm just reading from the text in the message. My two dogs in the front are just happy things to me because who doesn't love dogs? I know, I do. I provided a different type of skin on the dogs to make them look like superheroes and I pasted lava into my skin. So that's a lot of imaginative stuff to do with the masking and I think that it's so detailed that that really looks amazing. Let me make sure my screen is bright enough. Okay. Wow. <laughs> I mean, I love the graffiti. So what do you guys think? You can type into the chat if you want, or you can just um, speak up. But I think this is, you know, it takes a while to look at it, but there's a lot of different pieces and that's why it's almost like a puzzle coming together, but it really has a nice feeling of unity because um, to me, that arching sort of tree area that looks like it was masked out up here and then coming up to water kind of gives us a nice arch where a straight cut right across a straight line would split the image. But for some reason, having that a curve is the major element in a design or a diagonal or a curved diagonal tends to really bind things together. 
So I look at this as supporting content up here, but my eye keeps flowing around in a circle because of this art. So that's really nice. The angel looks great, you know, compared with the graffiti that's rougher. And I really like these masks with the texture dropped into them. For the dogs, it's so cute. Yeah, let me <laughs> stay zoomed in. Um, and I just, oh, that's great with the eye peeking through. I had a dog that looked just like that too, <laughs> chowder. <laughs> but the chain sort of referring to the breed and um, that's really great. So any other comments? What kind of mood do you feel like that brings? I mean, do you feel the separation of mood between the top and the bottom like he wants you to? Yes. Yeah, so for you, what makes that you know, a different mood on the top and the bottom? Um, like how the um, different, um, how the, like you see the angel, then you see like the, like, like it's hard to explain. It's just like, you see two different, like you can see through, um, how should I put it? Um, it's hard to put in wood, but like it just gives me this mood that like there's there's like bad things in the world, but like there's also good things in the world at the same time that you you don't see that much. Yeah, is there anything in the design that sort of um, brings that out? You know, the color, or the patterns, or the way things are placed together. The the um the things that um mostly how they're placed together. Anything in specific that sort of jumps out at you is sort of bringing that feeling of balance um, to the image where there's good and bad, but um, it's balanced. I agree. I kind of get that feeling with it too. Anybody else? I mean, I've kind of, what I really like about this is this here, this split, I didn't notice this character up here. I kind of have to zoom in, whoops. And the, it almost like blends in with the trees, a kind of devil character. And this would just make a really nice, like animated segment or something or a background for a game. It's really beautiful. But the character kind of coming into the angel, but this sort of negative space shape that comes here that sort of that is really nice between the two they're almost an exact reflection of one another but one's the devil one's you know angelic so you know there's that difference but that's a really nice reflection sort of having a polar opposite and you can do that with the new assignment um, with the text or sort of that polar opposite content but something in the design because they look similar they're just reversed it keeps the design unified the reflection so that's a really really nice technique i mean this right here just zoomed in you know with maybe a little graffiti on the bottom could be a separate image onto itself if you print it it's so nicely composed uh, but i like this one too with the supporting content especially the graffiti the grime you know and then the seek there's like a balance back and forth throughout so I agree with you, Wendy. Yeah, the dogs even like that contrast between, you know, what we know as a pit bull, but having the cheerful, I mean, I love that breed, but the bright colors um, and the same with the silhouetted character back here. And I'm really glad you tried using the masks because that can be so powerful graphically. It just adds that sharp crispness that you don't see um, with the other layering technique that you have back here with the eraser tool. But having the two together is, or I mean, that's composed very nicely. I like this triangle too, between these three elements um, and sort of this color element here, drawing the color from the dogs up to form the triangle, but it also brings your eye right, follows it right through that doorway and then up above, really, really nice. So always think about how your eye is flowing around your composition like that. Where would the viewer's eye go? How would you see it if it's the first time you've looked at this image and you know, need to read it? Because that's basically what you're doing with a graphic designer and illustration is reading a visual image. So you want to bring the viewers in, you know, draw their eye back around, just like they're reading you know, an interesting book over and over again. So they see all the parts. And this does that really nicely. So great job. Anthony. 
so Wendy, do you want to look at, I mean, I can bring it up here, your beginning images that you're going to use. Let me see if I can find them. Okay, so I'm gonna zoom in. All right, so this is the one we looked at last week and I can see where you have kind of a silhouette, it looks like in there. Um, maybe not, maybe it's just part of the photo, but no, there's two photos definitely. It looks like stars. So it's got a really nice dreamy effect. I remember it was just the leaves. So yeah, that's gonna be a really beautiful textured background with just that reference to nature in there. Um, and the same with this one. Yeah, I like the leaves, like sandwich over. It looks like lights kind of coming through. If not leaves, some other kind of texture, or maybe it's reverse leaves. But that also, these kind of overall textural patterns where you can still read some content, though it's very subtle, work really well with the masking technique, with the graphic mask that we did, and also with the text that we're gonna be doing this week. So. Collecting a lot of those is a good idea. Just go out if you enjoy photography with your digital camera, um, find texture subjects, things that you like to photograph that you can use later on in future compositions. If you're really focused on nature and that's a passion for you, just keep a folder of all your nature photos and then you'll have collections of original images and not have to rely on pixels or Pixabay, which is fine, but it's always better to have your own Okay, so let's see what we have in the chat. Yeah, it, Marissa says it reminds her of butterflies or fairy lights. Oh, that's good. Yeah, definitely. Fairy lights or yeah, fireflies. It's got a really dreamy romantic quality to it. I think it's beautiful. I mean, in a way the darker, you know, and the purple is a little threatening so it could go either way. So I'm interested to see what you're gonna do with that. Um, um, that was, um, that was the yeah. blossom. So I, I had I took two pictures of different blossom in two different directions, and then I used the rotation and put it put it in like it was two two different and I rotated it a little bit, and I used the um, um blending colors for the um for each of them. Oh great! Try to make it pop up. So okay. that's how. The different um, blending modes. Yeah. Yeah. And then I put like an ocean. Ocean, so like it looks like it's reflecting on different, like the light is reflecting the trees around it. It does. I mean, it looks like it's in water almost. Yeah, like you say. I mean, I've seen like series of photos like that where you don't, they're not necessarily reflections, but they look like reflections and they're just, you know, beautiful with that kind of depth, especially because you're not sure exactly what you're looking at. It makes it more interesting. It's atmospheric, but you know, it could be looking down into water or looking up at sky. I think that's a really nice dual quality of that. But that one and the other one are really, really beautiful and have a different mood already. So um, save these always as originals too, even if you're gonna add to it, because these printed as originals would be a nice digital photo series. So <laughs> there's always things that you can peel back apart from your Photoshop layers and use as individual images. Um, that's why it's always, you know, again, I'm a nag about this, I know, but saving the Photoshop document is always important. So you have those layers there that you can dissect later and use for other things. And it's time saving, plus it's inspiring. I mean, I've come up with things years later, like, oh, I'm gonna go back and get that image and pull a piece out of it. So, you know, you never know what you might wanna use it for, but that really nice job on those, beautiful. I'm glad you're layering and I can't wait till you get your computer situation <laughs> straightened out, it's so hard. Um, but definitely worth it, you know, if you really like this to get a workable computer, um, however you can get it. But for now, maybe, um, yeah. Again, borrowing one or going over to the school in combination will help, but great work. Thank yeah, you. it is romantic. Um, and so Marissa, too, for the one by Anthony, I really enjoyed the ceiling and how the stingray is above the other animals. I like that too. I didn't pay as much attention to the stingray. It's sort of a supporting character, but it's beautiful. I mean, it needs to be there. And this, and it also reflects that shape that's in the center between the devil and the angel, which is nice. The center point is well put. Yeah, it's up in that 
top third. It's not right smack in the center. So, and it's also angled a little bit. And the color palette um, complements the scene. Yeah, definitely with the brighter colors up front, sort of leading back into the image. And then the more mellow colors, blues and purples on the top. Um, okay, any other questions on any of this? Or comments? Okay, I mean, I'll go on and we'll look at the next assignment. And you're using some of the same tools. We're just going to add in the text tool. So this is a much quicker assignment, I think. But um, it's an assignment where you're going to do some applied graphics. So you'll be looking at the specifications in terms of size for social media graphics, and then designing your image around that specific size. So I'll switch over to Blackboard for a second. Okay. And um, I'm going, I put this in the current assignments now, the past ones are, uh, the last one's down in the past assignments now. So I'm gonna go to the view so we can look at some of the images first. Okay. So here we go. This one is a one word story assignment. So you're gonna pick just one word, one word only. <laughs> some of these examples I have up here, I have a few more added words because they're off of posters or something, but you wanna stick with that one word, no other descriptors. You want the word and the images that you combine with it on a separate layer to um, reinforce one another and get your meaning across without adding any more text. So that's a powerful way to design for social media because as we all know, you know, you flip through a lot of different things and you have to grab at something that really jumps out at you. And one word graphics do that. Sometimes they can start to feel a little repetitive or sort of um, trite. You see some for you know, like motivational posters and things that if I see too many, I just pass over them. But then I've seen other graphics that just jump out and have an impact because they're original, um, they're clear, and you can feel that the viewer is sincere. I mean, the creator is sincere about what they were projecting out into social media. So you can be really direct with your message where all the pictures or whatever you include for visuals reinforces the meaning of your word. Or you can use irony where the text contradicts the image um, or vice versa. And sometimes you'll see that then it requires a little bit more work by the viewer. You're asking them to do more work if you design like that because you're asking them to decode the graphic. Like why doesn't this word match with the images behind it? What is the person really trying to say here and why? So that interaction can create engagement with your audience or it can anger your audience and get them to leave your graphic. But depending on how you work with it, it can be a really dynamic way of communicating in a powerful way. So think about whether you want to be direct or try to use some irony, but just one word for the graphic. So um, we'll go to this article in a second. I just put in Blackboard readings, social media meme, or yeah, social media meme design folder, which I'll add to. It's called Always Up to Date Guide for Sizing Social Media Images. It's got sizes for all the different parts, types of images you can upload to a specific app like Twitter or Facebook. It's the most popular ones. If you have some other sort of social media app that you use that you prefer to design for, that's fine. Um, you just have to go into that app and find out where they have their specs. They all have them, the size um, preferences located. They'll always put optimum pixel sizes. And using those is important just because, especially when you're creating one word graphics, if that word is chopped off because when it comes up to the viewer because you have not sized it properly, people won't always click on it to see what the whole thing is. Sometimes they'll say it's just lame and they'll pass it by it or they're not gonna be curious enough to see it. 
So you want to, you know, for professionalism and impact, make sure that it's sized correctly. So if, as a graphic designer, illustrator, you know, that's crucial. So it's important to always keep up with the current social media um, parameters. And that's why I like this um, blog that's here because she changes it up. This one is very recently because they change apps, apps change their um, UX design and at the same time change up their specifications for what they want for graphics. So we'll look at that site in a second. So you, you're going to choose what kind of meme you want to do. Go research the size, write down the numbers of pixels for width and height, and then you're going to create a new workspace in Photoshop with those dimensions. And then you're going to use the text tool and the other tools that you've been using, like the background layers and merging images together to create the visual content that supports or creates irony, if you want to do, go that way with the word. So you're going to save the images, as always, as a Photoshop document with layers intact, because you can take that Photoshop document and then change the sizing and use it for something else a lot of times and then save another JPEG version um, of the image off of that. So it's an efficient way always to have that Photoshop document with the layers intact and that you can pull JPEG, whatever other types of images you need, PNG or TIFF images off of, PDFs, et cetera. Um, the objectives are learning to locate and find size specs for various social media apps and to apply them using to creating a digital design for a targeted professional, again, professional and presentation and, um, you know, having words chopped off and pictures that look like they're not centered and things like that is always, you know, a giveaway. <laughs> um, but somebody's not really specifically created that graphic for that app. Um, and learn to use with the work with the Photoshop type tool. And as always, getting more practice with layers, masks, and layer masks. That's another tool we'll look at today. You've used layer masks already, but we'll look at how to turn them off and on when you need them and don't need them, or to apply them when you need to do something else with the image. And finally, the most important thing, learn to create a powerful visual message or meme that has double or reinforced meaning because of the dynamic relationship between the image and the text. And you've been doing that already with your images. So you're creating multiple images on multiple layers. They all have a relationship with one another. They all speak to one another. And in that way, they're very dynamic. And everything that you guys have created so far really is, um, you know, it makes sense. It pulls together with unity. Uh, the different units, you know, talk to each other. They have power in the relationship with their meanings to one another. So I'm sure you'll do a fantastic job with this. Um, here's a couple of examples. I put the one on top that we probably are most used to seeing. This was Shepherd Fairy, and it came out, I think it was 2007, the first election. And this meme got shared around so much on social media, which you know wasn't as pervasive as it is today, but also in print. Even though there was a controversy about him taking the photo of President Obama from a newspaper AP photographer, he did change it up in those three ways, change the color, crop the picture, change the context. So when the AP photographer did take him to court for using this, he won his case but agreed to share some of the profits he made from this because he printed it extensively on everything um with the photographer which is fair game i think that's a great way to resolve it but anyway this is a powerful relationship simple you know with the text simple text um, at the bottom you know no you know it's just sans serif simple blocky text with the same simplified blocky image that really is much more powerful than the original photograph photograph so you can crop in and you know, pick out a photo and use the filters to simplify it like this. That's one way you may wanna go. You don't have to. Um, whoops, let me just put this back to the side. Um, here's another with just the word wind sort of surrounded by some abstract. Um, 
shapes or these liney shapes that look almost like hair. And this is another way you can go where the image really supports what the text is. It illustrates what the text is. Um, the Obama graphic, you have to think about that a bit. Who is the character if you don't know him? Why does he create hope? This one, there's less to think about. It's wind, yes, this illustrates wind. You can do that. Um, I mean, it's kind of beautiful just reinforcing the text and words so they almost mesh together into one idea. Let's see what else. This is Milton Glazier, who is a really famous graphic designer that worked for decades and decades in New York City and just passed away recently. But he did some iconic graphic design with just a few words or one word. He did the I Love New York logo that was used extensively. This was another campaign that came out around New York City content, but it never got published. This was something that was found in his archives after he passed away. And I'm not sure what he's trying to get at exactly with this, but it's just such a beautiful graphic, um, one word graphic where the background is just pure white and all the content is contained within the text. So that's another thing to think about. And you can look at the rest. I was just gonna put, whoops, this one up because it was a school project. And I think it's kind of interesting. It's a photograph combined with a letter again to re, I mean a word to reinforce what that word is not play against it. Um, but it's really dynamic and printed large. It's just real beautiful the way that he's also turned it on its side. So it looks like a waterfall spilling down. I'm not sure if it's meant to be seen that way or if he's just holding that way. But I, I really, you know, I like the way that looks. There's something really peaceful about the fact that that's just a reinforcing visual with the water splashing on the word wave. It has, it's much less jarring where the, than the ones that kind of contradict one another. And I'll just grab one more to see. Oh, this is my favorite one. <laughs> um, this is a German poster, I think, um, from World War II. And it's just saying no. And if you know, if I'm not right, if it's not German, let me know. <laughs> but it's just saying no to war. And it's an anti-war poster, um, just a really, really simple silhouette done without Photoshop, because obviously they didn't have Photoshop at that time. But in the printing process, people would carve out a masking kind of gel to create a negative space graphic like the bomb and then drop in other images. This was probably found from a newspaper print or done originally. Um, maybe it's a woodcut or a lino cut, but it's dropped in like a silhouette, like your layer masks in Photoshop to the bomb to reinforce that information about the bomb dropping um, through the beautiful blue sky and then just the word no on the bottom, like this can't happen. And it's so simple, but so powerful. And this is one that had a lot of impact, like the uh, Barack Obama poster, it's still being shown around, it's still popular in social media and people critique it. So um, anyway, I'll let you look through those. And I have a couple of example assignments to go through for the step-by-step. -step. But before we do that, I'm gonna stop share. So are there any questions on this assignment or do you wanna take a break before we go into the, um, the demonstration? Um, I do, so is it on illust illustration, right? Yeah. Okay. You mean illustration or for the final piece? Yeah, it's an illustration. I mean, you're illustrating a text. Oh, the software, Photoshop. <laughs> We're not going to use, thank you, Kelly. <laughs> We're not going to use Illustrator until the next assignment. And if not everybody can get Illustrator, we'll use Photoshop and Illustrator because it, there's some overlap and they really should combine those two programs in my opinion, <laughs> but we will um, use both. So okay. Photoshop for this one, although this would be great done on Illustrator. And if you wanna repeat something like this on Illustrator for you know, your print design, you can, but we'll talk more about that later. Or you can even work off of these. So any other questions? No. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to um, go to share screen again and then go to Photoshop. There it is. <laughs> okay. So I just did a couple of examples of 
um, these, this assignment. I'm not really thrilled with <laughs> either of them. But just for an example, I wanted something for Twitter. This is designed for a Twitter post. So if I go to image size, up to the text menu image, and then image size, I can check to see what this is. So I went and looked on Twitter posts. I should go back to Blackboard and look at that other website. But for now, um, I went and looked at the blog to see what the current size is for a Twitter post where you're just posting a meme within the text of a Twitter post. And it was 800 pixels by 418 pixels. And then I'm leaving the resolution high. It's going to compress the image to the size anyway, you know, with that pixel dimension. So if you're set up for inches, what Photoshop usually defaults to, you just want to go when you start your new file, new, you'll see the same menu. You want to change that to pixels. Um, if you forget and don't change to pixels, you're going to have a massive image, and that happens every semester. <laughs> it's okay, you can just go back and rescale it. But if you find that when you start working, your image seems huge and you have to scroll around to get to parts of it, it's probably because that wasn't changed to pixels instead of inches. Pixels are just your picture elements. They're like the tiny dots that make up the grid on the Photoshop image for a bitmapped image and then also your grid on your monitor. So this is just scaled to be visible by people that are looking at an average laptop or average computer for the proper ratio to present a picture in, in this case in Twitter, so it doesn't crop off the text. And I still center uh, whatever text I have in this, I leave like an inch or so, or you know, a number of pixels on each side, say 200 pixels is about an inch, just to make sure it doesn't get cropped off on either end. Um, because sometimes, depending on how people's computers are, if they're, you know, have their window compressed, it'll crop the image. So that's just a safety guard there. And I'm just going to go back to exit this for a second. And then I'm going to go back and share the Blackboard again. OK, so here we are in um, readings and social media meme design. And always up to date guide for sizing social media images. And I love that this woman does this. I feel like I should donate money. <laughs> um, and so she just updated this in August. So if you scroll down, you can decide what social media you want to design for. And again, if it's not one of these, you can just look up the specs on the one that you're interested in designing for. So if I go to Facebook here, she gives me all the dimensions for the different parts of the Facebook page. If I want to design a profile picture, I need 180, 180 pixels when I go to a new file. If I want to design a profile, whoops, uh, a cover photo for the top of the banner on Facebook, it's 820 by 312 pixels. And it, photos, I mean, Facebook lets you resize things, but it's a pain sometimes when you load up an image and it's not designed for Facebook specifically, you sometimes end up having to crop off parts of your image you don't want to crop. So again, it's always good to check, research the dimensions, use those. And primary for a shared image, so people don't have to scroll around or click on it to see the whole thing, is 1200 by 630 pixels. So that's a really nice guide. And I, I see more things that would be helpful in this respect. I'll post them in this folder. But this one's really good. So I'm going to stop the share and now go back to share screen for back to Photoshop. Um, oops. Okay, so this was the vote, and um, I just include this now with all my tweets. <laughs> there are a lot of them. But anyway, here's the layers that are there. It's a couple of copies. It's got a fairly simple background. I found this image of the people with the flags online all over the place. Some were in paying sites for stock photos. Some came from other newspapers. 
So I'm just using this really for this example, and I would feel safe using this in social media, but I would not sell this image to anybody just because it has something. I would go pay for the stock photo if I was going to do that in this case. So I always like to say that. Um, but for this purpose, it's okay. Um, then I just added a really light vote. I used, in this case, and we'll go through it, the 3D text in Photoshop, where you can have something, a text that you type look like it's extruded. I have to say, I did two examples of this assignment because this won't work on every computer. It takes a while. If you don't want a real choppy looking edge to this, you have to tell the computer to render the image, which just means it looks at actual 3D content. This exists as a vector um, and then applies a bitmap to it. It's a lot of work for a computer. This computer of mine will do this. My other one won't. I just sit there forever waiting for it to render. So it may not be something you can use. It's a nice look, but use it if you can or if you want to experiment with it. And I did another one of these graphics that is not using 3D. So I did a couple of treatments to the text. This one was just on multiply opacity 74 because without multiply on normal, this looked just really kind of bland and gray. So um, I wanted to keep it sort of this blue bright down here. And then because I lost some of the lights up here so you can't read it, the flags are interfering with it too much. I just went over to layers and duplicated the layer. And I use that technique a lot just to build up effects. Then it duplicated that bottom layer. And this one I put back on normal and then changed the opacity to 74%. When it was up to 100%, none of the flags were showing through and it just looked weird. It looked like the pieces of the composition weren't unified. Oops, back to layers. Oh, this always does this, this computer, if I let my hand rest on this. Um, let me go back. That should work with, anyway, it had this little like thing right here, this glitch when it rendered and that happens a lot and it went right across where that flag was coming through. So I did not like that and I just went back and made that transparent so it looked like um, that was meant to be there. So I'm gonna close this one for a sec and I'm gonna say don't save. Here's my other one, but I'm gonna reopen that one again. Um, okay. So with that semi-transparent, if you zoom way in, you can kind of see that mistake and sometimes in Photoshop, I tried different ways to fix it. I just couldn't get rid of that without ruining the rest of the graphics. So I thought I'll compensate for it and just line the flag up with that glitch there. When it's zoomed out, it's not as noticeable. I could spend time fixing that and I probably would if that was gonna go out anywhere else. But sometimes you just need to you know, find a quicker fix to things. The fix is worse than you know, just sort of letting it be and trying to compensate for it. So that's why I lined up that flag. I stretched the background picture until I got that lined up right with that thing to disguise it. And that's also why I wanted it on 74 opacity and it could go a little bit even more transparent and still work. But at 100% opacity, I thought it was just not really, or the top one anyway. Whoops, that one should be on 74. Yeah, this one. It was just blocking it out so I couldn't see the flags through there. So that's semi-transparent. And then I moved it around a little bit to get it to fit on the background um, until it looked like kind of the hands were holding up a balloon. You can download type. We'll start looking at the type tool in a second. If you don't have fonts on your computer, typefaces that have the design you want, there's a lot of free ones available. Just go to a royalty-free um, text download site, just like you do with your royalty-free images and videos, 
and you can find a good variety of fonts that you can use there if you don't like what's available with your Photoshop or you know that's on there already as a default. But I'm just going to go to this background and then we'll look at the type tool because we all know how to place embedded. That's all I did to get the flag waving in there. So I'm going to click on that layer. And now here's the type tool in Photoshop. Over in your toolbar close to the bottom, it will always default to whatever color is here in your current selected swatch. Or over here, when you open up the characters menu, oops, I'm just gonna move this over a little bit. Um, in Windows, if you don't see that come up with type, you should make sure that that is selected or checked because character will give you all the specifications for your particular type font that you use or typeface for your word. So I'm going to text now, in addition to your options, you wanna have character open. So I'm just gonna click, when you bring the type tool cursor into the workspace, you'll see it kind of like this T that sits on top of it and you're gonna get dummy text. So this says lorem ipsum, like all your dummy text on Word and everything else. Um, I can just type there uh, the word vote. And I kind of like this text for vote because it's a little bit more rounded. This is Arial rounded, which is a new typeface that should come with your Photoshop. And I still have that other text on there, so I have to get rid of that. I should have deleted it first. There, okay. So right now, this is an active text layer. I can still change it. It's not set. It's kind of like a floating piece that you haven't hit return to set. So I can just go to move and move it around back to the type tool to work on it some more. Up here in your options, here's the list of all the different typefaces here. It puts your current ones that you're using on the top section here. So I tried different kinds of aerial or blocky text to see if any would work for this. And I ended up liking this rounded one best. Um, but here's all your other options. Depending on your computer, you can scroll over these and let your cursor hover there over the typeface. And then you'll see in the window what that is to preview it, which is really, really nice. Not every computer will do that. So you can check in your preferences to see if there's a way to set it up that you can, but in my older laptop, I can't do this. But anyway, you can just click on them to preview them. It's not a disaster. So I'm gonna go back up instead of going through all those, but there's so many there. If you see other typefaces that you don't have that you want, again, go to the free sites, make sure it's one that gets good reviews, that it's not a dangerous site for your computer, but you can download free font packages and just have they'll self-install on your computer when you go to download them, once you open the download. Okay, so here's vote. I can click on it again. I'm going back to the text tool. I'm gonna click on it because I want this line below it to show that I'm editing it again. And here's your type size. And you can type in a custom size. It gives you this list of standard sort of type sizes. But I might want this bigger or something in between. So I'm just gonna type in 80 points here. And that's probably what I did it at originally. Let me try 100. And it should enlarge. If you don't see it, I'm gonna go back and click on the end of the type scroll back over it to select it while I'm in the type tool. There it goes. And now it's editing again. Okay, and I still have some trailing text over at the side. But I'm going to put this back around 60. I sort of like having that edge over here. Again, having the border. Um, and now I'm going to go back up to my characters menu. And this is really helpful with most Typefaces, not all have this, but 
this defaults to what's called metric kerning. And when you go into graphic design, if you do, kerning is just the spaces between the letters, but it's not just the spaces, it's how the different letters relate to one another. So this O and the T, for example, has, they're looking at negative space when you're dealing with metrics and kerning. There's a lot of negative space between the T and the E, and there's a lot in this typeface between the O and the T. Metrics is just sort of a straightforward spacing that's not considering what the um, negative spaces are. If I change this to optical, that shifts the type um, together. So it's more, it's taking into consideration those negative spaces and trying to minimize them as much as possible. In this case here, you really can't minimize this too much because the top of the T would bump into the E and look weird. So um, if that bothered me, I could render this type. Right now I can't cut and paste it and move it around, but I would render the type and then shift the E over manually at a point where I could do that. So we can look at how to do that too. So back out, um, I'm still in the type tool. Oops, move this up. So if I want to change the color, this color swatch here in your characters menu will allow you to pick a new color for it. And again, I'm going to have to, I don't know why that does this. I don't always have this situation. Sometimes I can just be direct. But anyway, here we go. I want to change it to blue. That's my new color. And when I click off of this, it'll be blue. And I can also change the regular spacing between the letters. I can, there's plus and minus here under where it says auto, I mean VA for your spacing. I could space them out. So you can be pretty particular. Again, that's tricky. It's different than kerning. That's the negative space specific to the letters. Spacing is just general spacing between the letters. And I want to leave some space there. Um, especially if you want to use the 3D or try to experiment with that. You want to leave a little space between the letters. And you can also change the proportions and kind of customize your type this way. If I want this to be a real stretched looking vote, I could maybe put in 130 in the um, vertical proportions and get a more stretched text and vice versa over here. This is your horizontal proportions but I'll leave that like that for now. And then these are super text and other text annotations um, strike through that you probably won't want for um, banner text like this. But now I'm going to click and move it down. So it's just over the hands. And at this point, um, I like the way it looks, but the text is kind of really not dynamic and it's sort of showing, I mean, it's blocking out some of the hands. It looks like it's floating on top, but really doesn't um, have a home there in the design. So I'll try a few things to it. Mostly I would use layer, layer styles like we've been using in the other assignment. But I'm going to try using 3D type for this. So I'm going to select that type layer. I would like to get rid of the extra type over to the side. Let me see if I can do that first because it takes up memory, computer memory to do the 3D and I don't want that interfering with it. Okay, so it takes more grind time on my computer. So over here on the far right hand side, well, one more thing first, um, this is something you may use. <laughs> Here's your center and your justify right and left, just like in Word. But this bend with a T, it sort of has a, a curved band underneath the T for text, allows you to style it. So if I want this to, for instance, bend up a little bit with the movement of the hands, I can choose arc. And then you have this menu that allows you to choose the amount of the bend or how much you want it to distort. Whoops. My computer is so picky with this kind of menu. There you go, come on. There, I just want it bent a little bit, but not that much, there. <laughs> and then also horizontal, you can have it sort of, and you can use type to sort of wrap around, you know, if you have an object where you want it to look like a label is wrapping around it, this is a nice tool for that. 
vertical distortion. Um, if you don't like the preview, just click cancel and then you can go back and start again. Uh, let's see, there's other, there's so many other ones. You can get wavy looking type, um, bulging looking type like this where it's kind of looks like it's bending out instead of just a direct curve. I'm just going to grab that one. So you can really distort or you can just do a subtle distortion. But that helps with that idea of unity because the background had a curve where the raised hands in the middle are higher than the raised hands on the end. It's sort of a real nice symmetrical curve. I wanted to reflect that in the type so it looks like the type is more unified with the background. And just doing that little bit helps with that. But I still want more unity to the type. So I'm going to see how the 3D works with this particular typeface. So I have to go back and click on the T, click on the text, and now I'm going to 3D way over to the right and your options for type. And it's asking me what I'd like to switch to the 3D workspace. I really don't, that, but that's another thing. I'll do it just so you can see in Photoshop, you have options about which customized workspace that you work in for specific tasks or techniques. So I'm gonna say yes. And then that optimizes, whoops, my workspace. There we go, uh, for doing 3D graphics. So I kind of like the way this looks. You've got different settings for your, um, how your 3D is treated. Um, this just has, this is the lighting right here. It's direct on. I can change that just by moving this slider around. And you could also change the size. You just kind of have to let your cursor hover over these different parts. It's showing you now this graphic in a 3D world where you can see these sort of diagonal lines converging onto a vanishing point. That's where the vanishing point is kind of where the center of my text is here. So um, I'm trying to keep that in mind as I change the lighting. You can also rotate the text around. And this can be tricky to use again if your computer doesn't process quickly, which this one doesn't always do. You can sit here and have things roll over this and it's not gonna move anywhere. Um, you kind of have to wait till that symbol changes. So this can be really tricky to use in Photoshop. It's not the best 3D tool in the world, but it's, it's like workable if you need a quick and dirty kind of 3D object. My husband really hates this and he won't use it, <laughs> but there's other specific programs for doing 3D things that you can bring into text and shapes um, into Photoshop. So anyway, I kind of like this, the way that it looks with the extruded text like this. Um, I like the shadow because it's giving me some depth that makes it look more connected with the dark hands in the background. And it's got some weight to it that I know I can make kind of look balloon-like, I, which I wanna do. So the trouble with this is right now, when I zoom in on it, if somebody looks at this close up, you can see that all this pixelization around the edges of the type. So if I just click off here, I could leave this 3D look as it is. And you know, this is small enough that you probably wouldn't see it. But the reason it's like that is because it's just giving you a preview of what the text looks like before you render it. Rendering means it's taking the 3D shape that it is, the vector shape, and then Photoshop is going to calculate how those shadows and highlights sit on top of that uh, frame, and then it's going to put out a smoothened version of that, and it takes a lot of work for the computer to do that. So in order to get it to render, I need to go back up to the 3D text menu on the top and tell it that I'm done messing around with it and I want to render the layer so I'll try this. If it takes too long on this one, I'll just go backwards and start the file again. But let's see if it'll go so you can see what it looks like. Okay, so it's working on it. You can see it's getting pixelized at first. You'll see a flashing edge. 
around the whole piece that you're trying to render is it's working, that tells you it's still working on it. Um, if you see that stop and it stops flashing, a lot of times it's the computer freezing up. So save your image before you ever render text or a shape like this with 3D because if your computer freezes up, you usually will have to just start again from scratch. So save the Photoshop document before you go to render. <laughs> um, when the flashing line goes away, it's finished rendering. So yeah, you know, this is pretty simple and it did it. So now if I zoom in, it's nice. I mean, I'm way zoomed in now. You can see the individual pixels and it's smoothed out the edges. You don't see that chunkiness. It's got some nice gradients to the shadows and it looks much better than before I rendered it. So I'm gonna leave that. Um, and just click off on a different, if I want to get rid of that background, I'm just clicking on a different tool. And it's got these nice cast shadows, which I think kind of work in this situation. So I'm going to leave that. And I'm going to just go back to layers and take this 3D layer and make it semi-transparent to see where it's sitting on the background because I want those flags showing through again. And that looks pretty good, but I'm not getting a lot of definition in the type. So I could leave it like this and it's not bad, but I don't really love it. So I'm going to duplicate this layer, going over to the sub menus for layers, duplicate layer, and then just making an exact copy on top of the other layer. Um, with normal mode. I'm gonna put this, I'm gonna leave this actually on opacity 68, just like the one underneath it. But now I can see kind of a crispiness occurring. It's sort of, this one is not rendered. And once you've rendered one, you've got to render the other. So if I turn this off, got to go back up. And that's something that I always, yeah, here we go, forget about. So there it goes again. And this is working much nicer on this rounded edged text than it did on the sharp edge text. It took longer time to render. So that's, I think another use, good use of the round sort of round corners on the text. So there it goes. Now it's getting smoother and smoother. I love watching that even though it's stressful because I'm always waiting for it to kind of freeze up on my computer. So if you can't do that, don't worry about it. You don't have to do that for this assignment. It's just something fun that you can use. There's other ways you can get the illusion of having three-dimensional text. And that can be done in layer styles, which should work fine on your computer. So I'm just gonna go up to layer styles now. And I'm gonna try to make this look more shiny. I think it looks really dull and I don't want to paint that in by hand. So if I go to Bevel and Emboss, I can try to manipulate the text to make it look like it's got a shine on it. I'm just going to move this over a little bit. So with Bevel and Emboss, you have different selections under style. I just chose outer bevel, but I'm going to switch that to inner bevel because I don't want like that kind of crazy drop shadowy look that it's giving me on the outside. I used it for the other graphic to look like fire, but this one, I want a smoother look that kind of makes this look pillowy and balloon like. So there's um, also pillow emboss, which might work. That's not bad, <laughs> but I think I like the other one better the inner bevel. It looks a little sharper. It left my shadows sharper, which I like better. So, um, and size, you can change that to look like it's stretching over multiple letters or if it's over to the left, staying isolated within the individual letters. And I soften that a lot. You can have a sharper bevel that makes your, the, the face of your type look like it's got a, a bevel or a, a curve to it. And that's something you can also do in 3D to render it. But again, it takes a lot of um, rendering power. So we're not going to focus on that a whole lot. It's 
something I don't use. I mean, in effect, I don't use a lot. I just like kind of using the layer styles to get the illusion. And then there's also the contours. You can change the angle of the lighting, which way the light is cast can have a big difference effect on your type. This kind of, when it was rendered, it looked like the light was coming from the left. So if I make that consistent, it's probably gonna reinforce my shadows better. And I'm not sure I like that, it's kind of too harsh. That's not bad. And then, um, the contour will change. This is just a direct gradient from light to dark in terms of the highlights. But if I want a more complex relationship between highlights and lowlights, I can change this contour. And some of these will give you a metallic look, the ones with the ripples, because there's a more complex highlight lowlight relationship. That's kind of OK. Now I don't like the color, so I would probably go back and change that. <laughs> but anyway, um, so the highlight mode also, there's modes here um, for how your highlights relate. So this is on screen. If I put this on normal, it's gonna be a little stronger effect. Back here, there's more highlights coming through um, in terms of the shine back in the shadows. So that looks more metallic. Shadow mode also, I could change or change the color of it if I wanted that to be maybe more blue. Yeah, I like that better. Okay, yeah, that's starting to, I want it to sort of reflect more of the deep blue that's in the flags here, but not get lost in the graphic. So I'm gonna say okay to that. So now I'm kind of liking it. It looks balloon-like. I kind of like it that it sort of looks like it's balanced on people's hands like a balloon. I'm gonna go back into the back layer and just make that more transparent mm, to mo look more balloon-like. And I'm not sure I like that. I'm gonna put that back up. <laughs> no, maybe I'll leave it back. <laughs> sort of in between. Okay, now go back up to my top layer. And now this is sort of bothering me down here, the shadows. I could get rid of those, the cast shadows from the 3D by just rendering this whole layer and going and erasing those. But I'm gonna see if I can disguise it a little bit and also separate this from the hands in the background by going up to layer masking again. I could go up to, I mean, layer style, or I could just go over to effects in that layer and click on it twice and it'll open up that menu again. So right now I have bevel and emboss checked. So I wanna add an outer glow. Wow, okay. <laughs> um, so that's set for yellow right now and it's pretty opaque. And the size is very large. I can rein this in by shrinking down the size cause I just want it sort of around the whole letters but it's also catching the shadows so I don't think that's gonna work. I'm gonna cancel that and then maybe try a drop shadow or I could even add color behind this by hand. But first I'm gonna try whatever I can in the effects menu because it just automates things. Um, So drop shadow is really bringing out the vote and kind of putting people into the background because I have this at a very large size again and it's sort of the distance of the drop shadow is set away from the text. And these you just really have to experiment with and go through the different types of things, options that you have in these menus, these sub menus. And I kind of like the way that that is giving a drop shadow. It's also the lights being cast from this bottom lower angle. So I'm gonna see if that will shift this into a more, a space where the um, people become a little bit more visible. And noise adds a graininess to it. I didn't want that. <laughs> so um, I kind of like the vignetting look where this is over to the side, but I'm not sure about this. 
I'm gonna, there, okay, that's better. So this puts more emphasis on the top of the boat. The shadows over here kind of like give a natural circle around this that brings the focal point into the center. So I'm kind of, I like that. I'm gonna say, okay. And now at this point, there's really nothing I can do to get rid of these shadows besides to use the eraser tool to get rid of them. So I want to render this layer. Right now it's sort of hovering like a um, smart object between being a rendered object, a bitmap, and being a vector graphic. So I'm going to go up to layer, rasterize, and say um, layer. Okay, because that just takes everything out of there. And then also I can, now my effects are still intact, I can render those also, but I don't need to because I'm going to, um, that's just gonna stay there when I go to use the eraser. So let's see if that helps. So back to the eraser tool. And I'm gonna pick, oops. a large-ish, oops, yeah, because this is a small graphic. You'll notice pixels are much smaller in increment than inches, obviously, so your brushes, you'll be using much smaller sizes than you would be working on a, um, a full-size graphic, like we did for the other images. So this is taking this out of the one layer, but also the drop shadow it's pulling with it because it thinks of these shadows as being which I kind of like, part of those letters. So I'm gonna shrink this down a little bit more. And then I need to go do this same thing to the layer below it. So layer, or it's not gonna let me erase because it's those shadows that are still staying there. So layer, um, that renders everything in that layer. And now I can, yeah, get rid of those shadows. And I would take a lot of time with this, probably zoom in make sure I'm getting right around the edges of the uh, letters with a smaller brush, or just kind of blend it so it looks like those are meant to be there as a drop shadow. And I'll have to keep going back and forth between the two layers. Okay, so I kind of like that. I'm not gonna get rid of them entirely because it kind of it looks like they're, and I have to go up to the other layer to keep doing that because there's still some shadow there. Cancel that. All right. And then if I go up accidentally to the edge of the layer, like I just did, I just have to go back up to edit and undo eraser. Again, like we talked about in other classes, you can step back about 30 times um, from a mistake you made, but then at that point, uh, the computer doesn't remember it. Okay, so I'm going to leave that for now because I would spend a lot of time doing fiddly <laughs> things with that. <laughs> I'm just going to zoom out. I don't think that's bad. I mean, I might try using some of the now blend modes to see if that works any better. I kind of like that better actually right away on um, multiply because it's just unifying the blues in with the cloud color more so it doesn't look like it's floating on top. It looks like it might actually belong as a balloon in that scene. Um, but I'm going to check out some of the others first to see if any are better than that. This one's not bad, darker color because it's shinier. It looks like it's picking up more of the light, but it's also more contrasty so it has more pattern to it and I'm not sure that's working for me. Whoops. That's too purple, too graphic, too dull, too weird. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I'm going to go back up to multiply. I like that. Um, and save this for now. So I'm going to save as. With everything intact, I want all the effects there. I want every, all those layers there. So I want to save a Photoshop document. So I'm just changing this to vote two so I don't save over the other one that I had because I want to keep that the way it was. But make sure layers is checked. I'll go over this every assignment because it's just always so hard when you lose the original. 
All right, great. And now I'm just going to go to save as again. And then save the JPEG version. I don't have to change the name because it's putting the extension JPEG. It's not going to save over the other one if I don't change the name because it's changing the name for me with the extension. And then click save. And I'm putting this at maximum, even at maximum quality. This being such a small graphic and because it's just pixels, um, probably about two inches if it was in inches. Uh, it's very, very small, even at maximum size, so I would have no problem uploading that to Twitter. I think maximum for Twitter is like five meg or three meg for a graphic, and then it kicks it out. I think it's three, and I think Facebook's five, but um, anyway, you want to make sure that, you know, you're below that, but this is well below it. And I'm just leaving this on baseline standard. Some people will choose optimized for web presentation. There's not that much difference. You don't lose image quality with standard where you do a little bit with optimized if you try to go to print this or something. So I'm going to leave this on standard and say OK. And now I have a JPEG version that I can upload to Twitter and it will fit right in there in a post. If I was doing a banner, I'd have to size it differently. I would go check those um, graphic dimensions again on the Twitter page or with that article on Blackboard and use those dimensions. So this is just sized for doing a Twitter post. So let's see. I had one other I worked on. I don't love it. <laughs> But it's just a different, it's not 3D, so I wanted to show that because not everybody's computer will deal with the 3D. There it is. Okay, so this is a couple of things I just wanted to explain. Um, one is using text. I don't really have, I don't have the 3D look to it. I could get that look by using the um, bevel and emboss, which I might try in a minute. But this is using the bend tool in your text tool options right here, where this was just designed to pinch in. So, you know, experiment with all those different bend forms because this is rendered. Let's, or did I render it? Let me see if I can go to the text layer. I've got a couple layers as usual for the type, but let's see. Um, just so it'll let me use the text tool. Okay. No, yeah. Anyway, but you have a lot of variety with that. So experiment with that because you can have things arc. This is just the arc with the vertical access, axes <laughs> um, pinched in in the bottom. Cause I kind of wanted the text just to look like it was coming out of these, their chimneys um, spewing out smoke. So this is a couple of different layers. There's the chimneys and then I have a layer with, um, let's see. This image that I found online, again, this is a newspaper graphic and a really nice photo. So if I was gonna put this out there anywhere else besides a Photoshop, I mean, a social media meme, I would give credit to the photographer, even though you don't have to if you change it three times, but I feel like it's you know the best thing to do in this kind of case when you have something that's a real distinctive photo and you know where source it's coming from. But I've added a lot of other things onto it. Um, I used a layer mask to get this circular shape. I just dropped in a circle and then selected it after I pasted it in with the magic wand tool and then did the paste into that we did last class to turn that into a mask. So if you don't remember how to do that, I won't demonstrate that again today, but that's on your last video from last class. It's the same exact thing. You're just doing a layer mask by selecting out by color with the magic wand tool or area if you have multiple color and then pasting, I mean, opening up a new image, going to edit copy to copy it into the temporary memory and then back to edit and paste special, paste into and that will drop um, 
an image inside that circular shape here that I have in my layer stack. And then the background below it is just a starry sky. This is how it looked before that was there. And I put that on the bottom layer. So that would show around the mask. So here's the original shape was just a blue circle that I dropped in and positioned and then selected it with the magic wand tool. And at first I tried this fire and tried to make it look graphic, but I didn't like that. So I just left that there and went on to something else and found this one. Dropped this photo in with paste into, and I like that a lot better. Sometimes I'll just leave the ones I don't like because I might want to use them for something else before I get rid of them, or maybe they'll work later on in the design process. But um, then I dropped in, I mean, I duplicated the layer because I wanted to add a brighter one on top just on this side. So um, I went back in and erased a little bit. And here I dropped in the smokestacks. Also with the, um, I did the same thing, selected the blue, and then went back to edit, paste into with this image of the smokestacks. But then I sort of, used what's called the layer mask as a, um, an eraser filter. And we'll look at this more next class in our review. But you don't just have to leave the masks as they're set, like this being a graphic circle. When I dropped this in, it was. But I wanted to use the eraser to bring back some of this smoky stuff from the picture, which is just these smokestacks with a bunch of pink smoke pouring out of them. So I switched in this layer. Let me zoom in. Whoop. Oh, I can't. I always forget I can't zoom in on the layer menu. Ah. But anyway, I switched from the layer that was the color version of it, the smokestacks, to the mask version, which is just the black and white with the picture indicating that it's pasted into the circle. Then I went back while I was in the layer mask and there's a white line border around that. And there's the plus sign linking these two. That's all important. You click in the middle of them to link them together. Then I went back and instead of using the eraser when I'm in mask mode, like I would if I was in full color mode, with mask mode, I have to use the paintbrush to get to work with this as an eraser. So what's nice about this, as soon as you're in mask mode, your colors turn into grayscale in your current color pick swatches. And when the white is here, this is a replacer of anything that was in the mask area. So if I erase too much, for instance, I can go back and put it back in if it's still there. But if I switch this by clicking on this little double arrow here, now the black is your top color swatch. This works as an eraser. And what I like about this is that it's a really dynamic way to blend multiple images together. I mean, if I went on, I'm clicking and I'm clicking and I'm erasing more and more and, you know, I'm kind of liking it. But then I get to a point where I erase too much of that image. If I was just using the regular erase tool, I'd have to go step backwards, step backwards under edit over and over again. And I'd get to a point after about those 30 or two things that I did between clicks where I can't go backwards anymore and I'm just stuck with it. The only thing I can do is sort of deal with it or load another image, which can be really time consuming or sometimes you have to start from scratch. But having this layer mask here is a safety valve for that and makes a much more fluid and dynamic design tool. So the layer mask, as long as it's still appearing there in your layer stack is an active part of the layer, you'll always be able to manipulate it. So it's good to leave a bunch of those on each layer that you're kind of erasing into. So now I'm gonna turn this back in your working file um, to white and go back over it. And now I can pull in a lot of that that I erased. And I just have this set on about 34 opacity in the options for the brush tool. And I usually change that to pretty low. 
Um, I get a more dramatic, quicker effect if I push this up, although I've made this transparent. Um, the opacity is just set at about 54 anyway. So you can see it a little bit better. This is what's underneath in that particular graphic, which I kind of like bringing back in more of the smoke, that the fire isn't just dominating the scene. So it gives me peace of mind. I'm more free in my design. I'm not like worrying, oh, I'm gonna wreck it, I'm gonna wreck it. <laughs> when I have a layer mask there, which I tend to get really nervous about. <laughs> so um, it's always disappointing to go too far and you just can't get it back. When you try to put it together again from scratch, you're not getting what you originally had. So this can help you avoid that problem. And it's sort of, it's also an idea. It's, you know, you can get ideas by working with it more fluidly. So now I'm gonna go back and maybe take out, I don't like how this is kind of obliterating the edge of the circle over here. Now I'm going back and putting it back on eraser to bring more of that in. So it's like back and forth. Okay, so I kind of like that. I'm gonna change this down to a less drastic uh, I changed the opacity so it wouldn't erase so drastically. Just to kind of pull these things together so it's not hitting that top so drastically up here. Okay, so I kind of like that. So that's a really nice tool to have. And again, if you're working on illustrations commercially, leaving a layer mask in each of the layers in your working file can really make things much more, um, I mean, it just helps with timing. If you're asked to change something in illustration, which always happens in your review process, if you have a layer mask, you can just go in and change the relationships between the different layers. Whereas if you just erase too much of something, and then you need to bring it back after you, you know, talk with other people about the illustration. You can't, the only way that you can is to drop in another layer and start from scratch. So that's a time saving thing. And if you're working, you know, by the hour or you're um, getting paid one flat rate for an illustration assignment, it's nice to have ways to save time on things and still have them look good. Um, when you finally, there's times when you need to get rid of that layer mask though while you're still in working form. And a lot of times it's because you want to draw something back on top of this layer and you can't. Um, and various reasons you'll come across when you need to get rid of that. So just to see how you put it there, if you're not doing a shape, um, to start with, I'm going to click on the layer to select it, go back up to layers and then drag down to the menu for layer mask. And here I can choose to delete that mask to free up that color layer so I don't have a mask attached to it anymore. So I can delete the mask completely, which will just take me back to the original image, which is just the flat image that goes across the circle. Or I can apply the mask, which is gonna take all the data from the black and white mask part of that layer and apply it to the image where it's transparent. It'll be permanently transparent where it's opaque. Permanently opaque and everything in between. So apply. And now the layer mask is gone and it's just an open layer with color and then transparency um, surrounding the color. If I want to put a layer mask back on it to work on it more, I can go back to layer layer mask and then this is a little tricky it doesn't just say in the sub menu for layer mask um, put on a layer mask it has reveal all and hide all and some people like to work with hide all mode and layer mask where it takes everything away in the layer and then you, by painting back over it with the brush tool to erase and replace they bring up the image slowly but I don't like working that way um, so I'm going to delete that and go back to my original color. And now when I go back up to layer mask, I'm going to say reveal all because that puts a layer mask area on that layer, but it's not um, making the rest of the image disappear. What's there in the color is there until I erase it. Okay, so let's see.
I switched the layers around a little bit, so it's changed the relationship with the text, which is interesting. Uh, let's see. So I kind of have to figure out what's going on. I think that I just probably changed the, maybe, there it is. There, the underlying text I had turned off. So that's how the text looks right now. Um, not using any special effects, just using that bend tool. Um, and then also after I did that on this layer, whoops, Here's the original type in orange saying denial, and that's just that same rounded Arial font. And then just going in and bending it with the type tool, um, bend tool. And then I just went up and selected it by color to create a mask, because that was the easiest way. And there's a lot of different ways you can create masks with the type tool. And if you know you're going to be using a selected type that you want to drop something into, if you click and hold on the type tool, and oh, this version of Photoshop, or at least this um, mode that I'm working in right now doesn't have that, but you can type as a mask. But I usually do this just because I like to see what I'm working on. And if you do it as a mask, you just get the sort of, you know, little dotted outline that shows that it's a mask. And this is easy just to pick up the color um, with the magic wand tool or I could use the shape tool and I'm just holding the shift key down to hit the multiple letters and then I can go and open up an image and I'll try to find something else for the type just so it stands out a little bit more Maybe the smokestack, the original one. Okay, I'm just going to go to select all to go over the paste into again. Um, if you didn't see the video from last class, copy. That puts a copy of this into the computer's temporary memory. Now I'm going back by clicking on the tab for the new image or the working file image. And now I'm going to go up to edit, file, whoops, edit, paste special, paste into. Okay, so that's dropped the clouds into the text. And they're pink, so I'll change those. But they're also huge, because that was a much bigger image in terms of pixels when I brought that in. So I'm going to go up to edit transform. This works just like any shape that you're dropping something into as a mask, um, even though it's text. So if I now shrink this with the mask on there, you can see different parts of the original image appear up through the type, like some of the smokestacks. Kind of looks like Star Trek. <laughs> I'm not sure if I like it. But um, anyway, just as an example, I like, it's sort of like that it creates some continuity, but it's really gaudy looking to me. So I'm going to try to pull those out. And then hit return. And let's see. So I'm going to turn that bottom layer off with the text on for now so it doesn't interrupt this one. And then um, I'm going to go see if I can pick up a layer style that will just offset this a little bit from the background. So I'm going to try drop shadow, which works pretty good. And distance will set the um, shadow either closer towards the left or further away from the type. So I'm going to leave that so it puts this darker area in the center that kind of brings the viewer's eye back into this man's hat that's standing here, the fireman, and the um, two smokestacks. And then um, I'm going to go up and change the color on this because I hate this pink. So adjustments, uh, color balance, I think, for Midtones, 
I'll bring it over into the green range to get rid of some of that because I wanted those blue clouds there that were original and then maybe some yellow to make it blend more unified with the background, um, the yellow fire. And then try the shadows too. There's not many shadows in this, but it might pull some more red into the yeah, parts of the cloud. That looks a little bit better. Okay. So there it is, it's flat text. And again, if I want this to look a little bit more dimensional, and you don't have to do the text, there's a many different ways and many different examples on the assignment in the ways that you can treat text. It can be much simpler, um, but I'm gonna I tend to do illustrative the kind of things that are, get kind of over the top. I'm gonna go to bevel and emboss, whoa. <laughs> and um, this is set on inner bevel. And it looks really harsh and kind of like metal. I kind of like it that way. But I'm gonna try the other ones to see how they work too. And they're all giving that kind of puffy look like now the text is puffing out by giving the illusion of that by creating a shadow and a highlight. Um, so the outer bevel kind of gives a beveled look to the outside like it's emerging from metal, but that doesn't, that could really work well on sort of a flat surface. But with this arc behind it, I don't like that at all. So I think I'm gonna, this one or this one would be my choice, probably this one because it doesn't have that sort of outer fuzziness to it. And then zoom back out to see how it relates to the whole thing. <laughs> and it's really kind of funky, but I think I'm going to just try to make that a little bit more transparent with the opacity. Yeah, I like that better so I can see some of the line of the horizon behind it. And then maybe try to see how it would blend. And I go through this with every layer with another mode, which is just making it more disruptive for the most part, but that one's not bad. If I see one like that, that's kind of giving me some brighter light where I want it or darker colors, I'll pick it and then just go and duplicate the layer. And then on the top layer, I'm gonna change this back to normal. And now just make the normal layer a little bit more transparent so I can see some of that contrast coming through from behind. So I kind of like that because it's letting the letters over here merge with the background a little bit more. And then they're brighter where they're hitting the world area. So it doesn't look like it's just floating. It kind of looks like it's emerging out of the sky. So I'll probably keep that. Oops. Um, so I would play with this a lot more and probably, you know, size the letters so it's the letters so they come in a little bit more tightly or a little bit larger in relation to the graphic. But those are some of the processes you can use while you're creating your meme assignment. The main thing is to think about the word that you want really carefully because you want it to be something that has impact and some importance to you. And then maybe find the word first and then find your supporting materials, images that you're gonna bring in for it. You know, decide if you want a sense of irony. Um, this one kind of has that. Maybe not so much, but you know you have to think about it a little bit more than the vote one is clear and right in your face about what that's about. This one you have to think about a little bit more because of the relationship of the word is not direct. Um, you know, with the image, I could have written pollution or something that would have been very direct, but I kind of like the the kind of relationship between word and image where you have to think about what that means a little bit. So. You can go either way. You can keep it very simple. You can use the layer styles and really have fun with those and make a wild um, composition. <laughs> but just keep to the one word and you can use as many images as you want with that word for this assignment. So I'm gonna stop the share here. So is there any questions about that? You're all okay with that? <laughs> okay, um, so if you're good with that, and um, we'll wait till next week, or actually the week after, I'm going to change the date on Blackboard. I haven't done that yet for the due date for this assignment. It'll be on the 22nd, I think. 
And then next class, we're going to go through everything that we've gone through in Photoshop. So try to upload some of your work in progress by then. I also wanted to mention about grading. I did want to put up the midterm grades. I don't feel right about doing that with anybody that hasn't turned things in because of computer issues. So if you've turned any work in, made comments on the text discussions page, I will you know, put in your midterm grade tomorrow, by tomorrow. If you haven't, if you've been struggling with the computers and such, don't worry about it. I'm just not gonna put a grade there because I can't put in an incomplete. Um, but whenever you upload something, when you finally get you know, the work online, let me know and then I'll submit the grade for it just so you know, there's something of substance there that I can put that to. So if you have any concerns about that, let me know. You can email me. Um, but yeah, you have an extra week now, so take your time. I'll change the date on that right after this. And I'm gonna put this video from this class online as soon as it renders. It usually takes about an hour. So you can look for that for the step-by-step -step for this assignment. And I look forward to seeing what you're gonna do. Your illustrations so far that you've showed have just been awesome for this class. And I know it's really frustrating for people that have computers that won't do all that as quickly, but just bear with it. By the end of the semester, you will, or you can use the lab times at school. Um, but you know, you'll, you'll be able to pull it together, I'm sure. And we'll take as much time with the later assignments as we need to make that you know, more, more doable. So I'm gonna go now then, if we, no more questions. The sun is kind of coming in through the windows now. <laughs> it's like about that time. So um, have a good weekend and I will see you next week and put up some more information for you on Tuesday and let you know then about that. I'll send out a, a text as usual. So have a great weekend. It's supposed to be nice, I think. And I'll see you next week. Bye. Thanks, Marissa. See you later. <laughs>